I now have a podcast with O'Hara and Joy Girl where we talk about things and stuff and you can check it out in the link in the video description. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam, but you don't care, nobody cares. Not even I care because the name of this date is Joy Boy and the out of context summary for chapter 1043 is as follows. Fruit Fight. Within the space of one chapter, Wano has gone from being relatively in control to an all out fruit based war. Whether it's a pineapple fighting a dragon, a boy literally named Peach who is a dragon, and all the while our main character is spontaneously melting into a vat of rubber goop as a result of, you guessed it, fictional fruit. Oh, and hey, he may also be a reincarnated god. That's, that's important, but not quite as important as Freddy Bingley, Mr. Dingus, and Mmmmm, all three of whom committed the joysome act of subscribing to the Grand Line Review, which will result in consistent injections of One Piece culture being administered directly into a YouTube feed. And if you'd like to be our next subscriber of the day, then hit the button and please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand fleet. Welcome. All right, so I know there's a pretty big damn thing that happened at the end of the chapter, but we'll need to save that for now. Because if I start on it, I'm gonna get lost and forget everything else, which I cannot allow. Because even with that final panel aside, this chapter was a pure powerhouse of, of general goodery. And some of that comes in the form of Bob Lucci. I feel like I've developed a surprising connection with this guy, which is weird because cypherpole agents are almost deliberately designed to be these like hollow shells of terror. More tools to be used than they are characters, but in his final moments, Bob Lucci, man, that guy really impressed me. And despite the fact that he is, well, he's very much not on our side, I do have a begrudging respect for his actions here. After ruining Kaido's fight, he doesn't even try to run. And there's something very powerful in that. It could be for several reasons. One could be the knowledge that he has no chance of escaping. And if he tries, then his death is just going to be all the more painful. And then there's another, which is a slightly more positive spin, which is that he is accepting his end with his head held high. Metaphorically, not literally, because he's doing doing this, but accepting his demise as a proud agent of the world government. It's a very simple action, so simple that it's not even an action because it's technically just doing nothing at all, but it was unexpected. I thought that he'd put up a bit of a fight, but I'm really glad he didn't because that gave him such an amazing moment. Although I do think a lot of the credit here does go to Pineapple, his fellow agent, because immediately after Bob Lucci and he does the hat tip, Pineapple does the exact same thing on the next page. Sort of like either a sign of respect or a way of saying goodbye. Whatever it is, it's definitely a subtle visual code that the agents have with one another. And it's kind of crushing and yeah, pun intended. Because even if they are villains, it's nice to know that they aren't completely heartless murder machines. And even if they do need to keep their emotions in order, they do care for one another in some way, which was also demonstrated when Squiddy got taken down by Izo. Bob Lucci had a very guttural reaction to that. And I swear these CP0 agents actually have much stronger bonds than our original CP9 agents ever did. The big question here though would be, is Bob Lucci dead? And and very uncharacteristically for One Piece, I'm inclined to say yes, for several reasons. Reason number the first, he's a villain. And in the extraordinarily rare cases where people do die outside of flashbacks, they are almost exclusively villains. And secondly, because of that beautiful hat tip moment. It's one of those situations where you don't need to see the body to confirm a death because pineapple's farewell ritual implies that for you. And again, when villains have died in the past, it's been in a similar way where the bodies just sort of disappear like Monet and Virgo in the punk hazard explosion. I mean, I guess I should never say never, but I would be beyond annoyed if Oda brought Bob Lucci back from this. It is a beautiful and heartbreaking death scene, making me feel things for a character who up until now had no real substance to him. Plus he also doesn't have any integral emotional story ties like certain Conjuros do. And to be honest, Bob Lucci, he's really more of a tertiary character. So I think this is as good of a full stop as he's gonna get. I mean, I'll rephrase that. I hope that this is the great full stop that he's gonna get. Moving over to serial murder Kaido now. In a second unexpected move, he was officially declared the winner of the fight by the narrator, which was almost certainly done by Oda to inflict maximum despair on the readers because the narrator is a voice to be trusted. You know, a lot of the fan base didn't believe that Zoro had beaten King or Sanji had beaten Queen before the narrator confirmed it. So having that authority not rule in our favor is it's pretty big. And it also opens up an insane amount of semantic speculation with the whole Joy Boy thing. You know, it's stuff like, yeah, Luffy lost, but next up is Kaido versus Joy Boy in punch fighting, which we'll get to. But alternatively, the battle wasn't labeled Luffy versus Kaido. It was referred to as the rooftop fight. So then it could just mean that Luffy versus Kaido was going to move to a new location. But I'm also aware that by saying that, I do sound like everyone who believes that the beast pirates are gonna get up by overanalyzing what could be quite arbitrarily chosen words. Like the thing is, it's, it's impossible to predict what is going to happen from here. This chapter ends with too many questions that all have an infinity of potential answers. But for now, Luffy did officially lose to 
to Kaido, interference or not, that's what happened, and we are now in, in very unknown territory. As for Kaido, this chapter was a pretty stark reminder of exactly what we're fighting against. In recent times, by which I mean the last year or so, Kaido has become surprisingly likable in my opinion. He was portrayed as an honorable combatant, he had the whole thing about potentially wanting to be Joy Boy and all of his identifiable drunken emotions, but in 1043, we, we kind of get slapped in the face with his more evil nature, and this comes specifically in how he demands that Momonosuke surrender. Because really, but there is nothing stopping Kaido from just, you know, floating on out and taking out Momonosuke himself. There's not even a fight to be had there, it, it could be done like that. But what makes this rather sinister is that Kaido is trying to inflict that maximum despair. He doesn't want Momonosuke to fall like a hero or a martyr, he wants the leader of this rebellion to give up and thus crush the spirits of everyone forever. It's very Luffy-like in a way, in regards to how he refuses to kill enemies and instead opts to destroy their dreams, which in many ways can be considered significantly worse. And in fact, this whole situation with Kaido is one of those ways in which the thing I just said can be considered the other thing I just said. Narratively, it's also very convenient, I should say, because it's an easy answer to the question of, well, why doesn't Kaido just end this while he can? Well, because of fairly satisfactory reasons. Having Momo give up is a much more desirable solution to killing him, and you know, potentially creating another Kozuki Odin figure. One of the things I loved most about this chapter was that once Kaido announced that Luffy had been killed, the very first voice to come out in protest was Nami, Nami of all people. It was the sort of moment I didn't even know I needed until it happened. And what it immediately reminded me of was One Piece Stampede, when all of the worst generation had been beaten by, by the big guy, and only Usopp was left standing against Douglas Bullet. Because right now, there, there are no great options left to, to punch fight Kaido, but even then, there and even in the face of an Emperor of the Sea, Nami, arguably the physically weakest member of the crew, is the one who takes a stand. And it's really brought Nami's Onigashima arc to a fantastic place, because it's been subtle, very subtle, but she has certainly had a journey here. Remembering that way back in chapter 989, she had that conversation with Frankie begging to run away rather than face an Emperor of the Sea, which was Big Mom. And now over 50 chapters later, which, which is ridiculous in and of itself, but over 50 chapters later, she refuses to run away against an Emperor of the Sea, arguably one even more terrifying than Big Mom. And Nami is, she's clearly scared out of her mind because she's drawn with all of, all of the shaky shakes. But I feel really proud of Nami because if she is not going to cower against Kaido, then there is no force in this world that can break her faith in Luffy. There's also a very underrated panel of Tama in the chapter, which I point out because Oda didn't just choose to focus on her randomly. Tama is a big, big emotional centerpiece of Wano. She is a shockingly huge reason why Luffy is even fighting to begin with because he promised her delicious, delicious foods, but also because of Tama's connection to Ace. In this moment, that wound is being reopened because Tama has just lost another brother figure, or at least she thinks she has. And even though this is the kind of thing that I think 99% of people will just blast through and move on, I really like that Oda chose Tama as one of the few characters reacting to Kaido. Also, isn't Marco fun? I really love his like his spinny, spinny shield that he can make with his bird fire. Visually, it's probably one of the coolest techniques in the series, and thank crap he's here, because because there is essentially nobody else who can still stand against Kaido. I mean, there are some of the vassals and some odd straw hats like Jinbei who can still do some of the punch fighting, but the heavy hitters, they're pretty much all down. In fact, come to think of it, this is one of the very few times in, in the ever that all three of the monster trio have been knocked out at the same time. Also, did we just have a bit of a reveal when it comes to Law? I understand Momonosuke being able to sense that Luffy's voice had vanished, but Law displayed a very similar sense here, which is probably almost certainly explained by observation Haki, but it was just suspiciously similar to Momonosuke's power. Now, speaking of Momo, he wanted to make what was theoretically a sensible decision by giving up, which honestly, I think is commendable because he just wants to stop the suffering of his people as much as possible. But Yamato's speech was lovely and extremely important because as stated earlier, the moment that Momonosuke surrenders, this fight is over. All right though, let's let's talk about this whole Joy Boy thing. I think it's fair to say that this was a twist nobody was expecting. I mean, maybe something like this was going to happen in the very end game of One Piece, but according to Zunesha, this is the Joy Boy, not Luffy, with Joy Boy's inherited will, like the actual 
Lovejoy boy. And it's a revelation so big that my inferior mind brain doesn't even really know how to start processing it. Because there are just questions. So, oh, so many questions. Like is Luffy a reincarnation of Joy Boy? Was Joy Boy some sort of spirit that was, was residing in Luffy? Is Luffy Joy Boy himself, but with some very convenient amnesia that took, you know, several clubs to the face to solve? And there's even the very real question of regardless of what happens here, did Luffy technically die? Not permanently, obviously, but his voice did disappear and in its place, we now have drums and, and Joy Boy. And Wano does appear to have a solid theme of death and resurrection happening, particularly with the monster trio. Sanji was prepared to part with who he was in order to become something else. Zoro may literally be facing off against death as we speak, and now Luffy, he's done something very similar. All three of them have now had to confront death in some way. And I imagine that all three of them are going to come out of this experience significantly more powerful as a result. Of course, amongst all of our insane questions, are uh, what exactly is happening to Luffy's body in that final panel? Because it looks like he's melting and my immediate thought was that this was a devil fruit awakening. Because what's happening here from the very, and I stress this very little we can see, is quite reminiscent of Kanakuri's devil fruit effect, where his body could also become goop. And I really hope it's that, because there is currently nothing that excites me more than the idea of Luffy being able to fight using Kanakuri's extended powers, which would continue to tie Whole Cake Island into the story brilliantly, basically turning it into a retrospective training arc. And there is also something else of note. On the final panel, the sound coming from Luffy reads as Nika, a name that might be familiar to many of you as the name of the sun god. And Nika is a Japanese onomatopoeia that means grinning or smiling, but in a specifically cheeky manner, which leads me to believe that Oda is really hitting home this whole Luffy, Joy Boy, Nika, glob connection. They're all the same. And at this stage, I feel like we can say with pretty solid certainty that Luffy's devil fruit is the one that the elders were talking about. And that rather ironically, they've had a very active hand in starting what they were attempting to prevent, and thus also potentially making Bob Lucci one of the most consequential characters in all of One Piece history, weirdly enough. But just take a second to savor this. We may very well be in a situation where in the very next chapter of One Piece, Oda will either show Joy Boy in full for the very first time, or we will get to hear him speak. Both things I never thought would happen outside of a flashback. Among all of this, I do have a very real concern. Maybe it's not real, maybe it's just a me thing, most things and me things, but it's the whole increasing idea of Luffy being the chosen one, which yeah, yeah, they get, it's a thing that's been happening throughout One Piece, but it was one thing to be carrying out the inherited will of Joy Boy, another to quite blatantly have the forces of fate on your side, but this is a whole new level of chosen oneness because Luffy may quite literally be Joy Boy. And I've always been a much bigger fan of Luffy just, just being some guy who, I guess incidentally saved the world by trying to selfishly pursue his own personal dreams, which can still happen, I have faith in order to pull this off, but One Piece has now literally changed forever. The worst thing that could possibly happen has indeed happened though, because we have a break next week. Uh, break. Quite possibly one of the worst chapters in recent memory to be left on a cliffhanger with. It is so good, it's torturous, that kind of thing. But I can't imagine that we are not going to cover this immediately in chapter 1044. Sometimes Oda does introduce cliffhangers and then leaves them sitting for a handful of chapters, but but this, this is just too big. And we're not done discussing Joy Boy either. In fact, I'm going to have a whole dedicated video to this topic to be uploaded ASAP, mostly because I didn't want to turn this into an hour long chapter review. But rest assured, there is a ton more to dive into and uh, I'm gonna go make that happen now. But while you're waiting for that, here's another video thing, because there's always more to learn, explore and experience with this wonderful series. So I look forward to seeing you there.